Another shift that is crucial for our way of working with languages now is a shift from the cultural to the intercultural. What the shift uh, there is with this paradigm shift that we're trying to render is that um, we are not just um, dealing with culture as observers so we can observe um, the, the artefacts that come from Japan. We can observe uh, a film about the tea ceremony of Japan. But rather, we invite students to be participants in that culture. And as participants, there is then the question of who can I be in that culture? Can I be myself? Do I have to try to be someone else and think back to the notion of native speaker? Do I somehow have to try to be a native speaker? Well, you can't. Uh, and so the reality is that um, again, we are moving between the culture that I know and the culture that I'm stepping into through learning um, a new, uh, an additional language. It's through reflection, actually, and it's at the point of reflection that the real intercultural understanding actually emerges because it's through reflection that people come to understand why did I react to that? You know, why is it that I feel uncomfortable eating noodles for breakfast when I'm used to my toast and Vegemite? Now, I say that as a basic example, a terra terra example, um, but pull out from that to any other phenomenon um, that, that's part of our interaction with the world and you see that, that it becomes um, really important to understand, uh, it's, it's crucial to understanding the other. So Angela, do we need to actually shift how we understand culture in that? Because we it do. sounds like it's not the idea of the target language culture that we're working with anymore when we say intercultural. It sounds like it's much more the culture of the person and, and what sits behind that I think, person. I think that um, Halliday had it absolutely right. Um, and uh, Michael Halliday, as our most eminent linguist um, in Australia, described the context of situation and the context of culture. So in an interaction, we've become very good at recognising that the variables in that interaction give us, uh, so force us, force us to engage in a particular way. So if I'm in a church, my behaviour is going to be very different from if I'm in a marketplace. The conversation that I will have in the marketplace is different from the conversation in a church. And so we understand the situational variables. It, it is the case that those situations are at the same time, if we take the lens slightly further out, those situations are also within a culture. And the larger cultural uh, envelope is missed. And it has been missed because we have taken a cultural view, not an intercultural view. So when I was teaching French monolingually, and I was, when I was doing that, I was so intent on teaching about the French culture in as rich a way as I could, but it was about. It was not understanding that every act of communication involves the context of the particular situation, the participants and their cultures, as you were um, asking Michelle, and on top of that, uh, the wider cultural envelope in which those situations play out. And for some reason, it seems to me that everybody has understood communication in the context of situation, but because we've tended to stay inside a language, the, uh, the, the context of culture 
has been put to one side. And this is what we're trying to, to teach students in communication. And the interpretative really um, is uh, a crucial dimension of everything that we're saying uh, here, that there isn't one way that our interpretations do come from somewhere and that we need to understand better and better where that somewhere is. It's, it's an iterative process. Yes, it's an iterative. Of process. continuing re reflection. And, and sometimes it surprises you because yes. I had an exchange with uh, a, a potential student from Indonesia who was looking to study in Australia and he'd contacted me and addressed me um, initially as uh, Pak, which mm -hmm. is Mr. Um, uh, you know, dear pa Michelle, or um, uh, which uh, he may have interpreted Michelle as Michael, uh, yes. which can happen sometimes. However, he, he went on with his request and uh, and signed off. And so I responded, and in brackets, I thought I would indicate that I was boo, uh, miss, missus, uh, female, and I assumed that that would actually. Um, you know, go in and that he would then modify his yes. response. And the next one came back addressing me again as Puck. And I surprised myself because I was actually quite annoyed by this. Yes, the reaction. <laughs> Even though normally I wouldn't consider no. uh, gender to be no. much of an issue for me. Uh, uh, you know, it's not something I think about terribly much, but it really made me think about how I was being viewed yes. and the assumptions I think that he was probably making that being an academic, maybe I should be male. I don't know. I don't know what the assumptions were, but it really made me question it, yes. question yes. my response. And then I politely replied back again, yes. um, boo, uh, <laughs> uh, again, um, yes. to, yeah, to, um, to highlight it. And, um, and yet I hadn't realised that that would be of a concern to me. That's right. What's really interesting there is that um, you became aware yourself of your own reactions. And, and how I was being yes, viewed from yes, outside. Yes, from the outside. Mm. And I think that, uh, again, uh, in language uh, teaching and learning, um, we haven't paused enough to consider the reactions and so on. And in a class, it might take two extra seconds to say, how did that make you feel? Uh, and then we open up uh, that discussion. Um, now, that takes us, of course, to another issue that um, many teachers raise about this idea of reflection um, and the lack of comfort that uh, teachers uh, have because of a feeling that um, it will be done predominantly in English. And this um, takes me to the notion that if we separate English and the target language and we're concerned um, that there might be too much uh, in English. The whole of the working in this intercultural way is very much integrated. It is not as though we separate the reflection completely from um, the work in hand. And we've got a lovely example here from um, Marnie Foster, mm -hmm working in Chinese in an all-girls school. She did a fabulous um, unit of work on um, translation. And she asked her students to really look at a whole host of different texts uh, in translation. And of course, uh, the texts included Chinglish. And so there were mistranslations and uh, really clumsy English. What sort of texts were these? They were uh, signs in the linguistic landscape. They were signs at hotels um, where um, in China they had tried to present the Chinese and the English, so bilingual signage. And of course, there are some clangers there. Um, go and have a look. Quite hilarious. It is. Um, and you can imagine that for the students actually seeing these, um, the uh, jubilation uh, and interest at how one could get English so wrong. But Mani was wanting them also to understand um, what goes on in translation, that meaning is lost, 
but meaning is also gained in translation. She was trying to get them to reflect on what makes a good translation. And ultimately, the translation is not just about words, but it is about cultural meanings. And that's what she was trying to do. So uh, uh, she asked them to keep and uh, maintain a journal throughout the process. Uh, that journal was in English. Uh, but you see, it was a, a, a unit of work on translation. So the two languages needed to be there integrally. And what she did was she gave them um, uh, another Chinese text and, and two uh, English translations and asked them to consider which was the more effective. At the end, the reflection was not on um, what do you make of translation and, and uh, things like that, which would have been quite legitimate and why do some translations work better than others? They would have been legitimate reflections. But what I liked about what Marnie did is that she broke that and she said simply, would you choose to stay in that hotel, the hotel with the mistranslated signs. And that takes us precisely to the students being placed in a situation where they see mangled English. How would they react to that? Would that inspire confidence in them staying in that hotel or would they want to run a mile away? So we have very clever ways of doing the reflective work. It's not just, okay, well, what happens in translation because this is a unit on translation, but actually using that material in a really integrated way. Um, and for my money, if some of that is in English, so be it, because I would rather have the deep understanding of language and communication and what it means to communicate successfully, uh, appropriately, richly across languages and cultures than um, to have the superficial chit chat, um, which a lot of language teaching and learning had become as we were buying train tickets and transacting uh, to go to the cinema and so on. So this is a lovely quote. Languages are in crisis. This may be a good thing. What does it mean to be a student, a learner or teacher of modern languages? In economics, for instance, one studies structures and functions and relations that combine to make up an economic system. The same is true of sociology and history. Yet when we come to modern languages, we drop the whole idea of interrelationships and we extract language from social encounters and literature from life. Compelled by functionalist arguments of serving literary study or of serving goals of employment, everything that relates to life and relation ends up being nothing more than a social accoutrement or fabricated fetish. The heart of languages, which is intercultural being, is lost. This is the crisis. Why is the functionalist argument so able to overwhelm us? Unless we actually centre languages at the heart of life, at the heart of intercultural learning, grounding a fresh curriculum in common experience, then the marginalisation will continue and our curiosities for other worlds and other ways of being will continue to be eroded. I think this captures a lot of the discussion that we had yesterday we heard a lot about heart, about curiosity, about the magic and mystery of language learning. And so from the floor, we were hearing these kinds of messages. And what I think this is saying is that we need to return to some of that heart in what we're doing to, to actually bring back the emotional connect, connection, bring back the aesthetic uh, dimension of what we're doing and really place languages at the heart of the human experience. If we just see language as words, our practice is going to reflect um, a great deal of attention to words, which, of course, is important but not um, sufficient. And so the story is that we'd like you to stop and pause and reflect on your own sense of what language is and your own sense of what culture, cultures, 
um, is, are, and to try and see what messages about those big ideas you're actually conveying in your classrooms. So can we hear um, your reflections on language uh, first, and we'll take um, a few tables. Uh, any volunteers? We were talking about um, drawing attention to the culture within the language. So not just teaching yes. them separately, but through yes. that language. Um, for example, um, the word for mum when you're talking about your own is different to the word for mum when you're talking about someone else's. It's more respectful. Yes, yes, yes. Lovely example there of how language and culture come together in the very word, that it's a word concept uh, that we're working with. Yes, more ideas. How do the Chinese write the character one? Horizontal, same as the Japanese. Okay, it's horizontal. What does a horizontal line represent? The Chinese think of the world in a horizontal plane. So basically in the simple learning of a very basic elemental numbers, you get a whole cultural uh, iceberg of stuff to discuss, which is philosophic, um, it's visual, um, it's existential, it's everything. I want you to think about it as um, a sense that we are expanding and need to perhaps expand our own understandings of what this thing called language actually is. What we have to realise is that what's actually going on is an exchange of meaning between, among people. And therefore, what's going on is that I need to interpret your meaning, Eric, for example. I need to interpret Eric's meaning while Eric is actually interpreting mine. And one of the fascinations for me about language is that another person may not receive my meaning in the same way as I intend. And that can happen within a culture and language. When I'm speaking English, people don't, uh, you know, if I, I check out with you guys here, you might have 20 different interpretations of what I'm saying at this very minute. And the fascination for me was gosh, how do we deal with that? And the additional layer in language learning is how do we learn to do that across languages and cultures? Everything that we interpret, the way we see the world, the way we understand things is through the cultural lenses that we bring. And as we are learning to work in another additional language, we are actually um, moving between different understandings, different conceptions of the world. We're, we're thinking about how we may see it in our own language, but we are travelling towards um, another language. And as we do that, we are mindful of George's notion that if I'm speaking to someone with um, a Chinese background, that exchange has to take into account that they will see the world in a horizontal and not a vertical way, which might be my particular way. And that example is an emblem for how we have different language, a linguistic and cultural understandings that we are trying to navigate, okay? It's well beyond the hello, how are you, good morning, yes, I'm fine, let's go to the beach today. It's much more than that, important though that is, it is also how they learn about how meanings travel across languages and cultures. That's the kind of expansion we're interested in, how it is that each one of us actually understands this thing called language and this idea of culture. <laughs> <laughs>